So I'm Karen Aviasaf Migdal, and I'm from Israel, as Sana said. And I'm going to uh, share with you today a few milestones and takeaway from my journey in the career for the past 20 years. I'm going to do it really quick uh, because we don't have a lot of time. So who am I? I'm a fintech advisor. I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm also a speaker and uh, hosting in many conferences. And I'm also, like yourself, a gender diversity uh, believer. But I'm also a family person. I'm married and I have uh, three kids, a son, three sons actually, it's very tough, and <laughs> one dog. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm also vegetarian and I do a lot of yoga and I love art and I love science fiction movies and uh, books. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the career that started somewhere around 2000. Uh, I was finishing my BA and my MBA. I was actually learning statistics and business administration, which is very different from the place that I am today, as we discussed in the morning panel. Um, 888, for those of you who are not familiar with the company, is a large gaming company operating worldwide, offering casino games, poker games, sport betting games, and other skill games that, uh, that are possible. Everything is online or mobile. I was working there for nine years, and it was actually a very good place to start my career. I joined them as an analyst. Um, they had a lot of data. Back then, it was all we also uh, just statistics. We didn't talk about big data or AI or anything around that. We just had the numbers, and we did it, needed to analyze them and to reach the trends. So first thing, they sent me to Antigua, which is an island in the Caribbean. Uh, yes, <laughs> why not? <laughs> well, my parents were not so fond of the idea, but uh, I was young and I had nothing to lose, so I took my passport and I traveled to Antigua, which is a very nice place to whoever from you who didn't travel there. I was living there for several years, working in the operations of the company, which used to be in Antigua. And the company was only 50 people by then, all together, like Israel and Antigua. Today, there are over 800 people working there in different locations. And I moved there. I came, and I told them, OK, you wanted an analyst? An analyst. OK, tell me what to do, and they tell me, just do whatever you want. There's the data, and then you can do uh, what you think we should do with the data. So I just touched everything and analyzed everything, and then I figured that uh, a lot of places in the, in the company can use uh, actual performance and uh, monitoring tools in order for them to work better, to increase the sales, to increase the conversion, the success rates, and uh, to work better in uh, all kinds of uh, spheres that uh, they did. So I was working there. After a few years, I came back to Israel. And I was working in the office in Israel. Um, there I, I got promoted to the risk management and um, e-payments department. Uh, which I managed eventually after a few years. Uh, this department was responsible for all the bank relationship that we had over the world, and we had several uh, relationship with banks, with credit card companies, with Visa, with MasterCard, uh, with alternative solution providers like PayPal, but we had different wallets at that time. And I was managing everything uh, in the place that we call the web cashier, which is until today the place when a user comes to put money inside a casino, the online casino, he needs to put the money to transfer the funds, and then he can play on these funds. So we manage it uh, on the commercial side with the banks. We manage it on the product side and the integration side of how to do it the, quick, the quickest as possible for the user to increase the conversions. And also, we had uh, some issues with fraud prevention and identity thefts and robots that were playing instead of people, and abusers who got the bonuses and didn't play over the bonuses. So I was very busy during that time, <laughs> uh, working in all these angles, like trying to have the funds flowing as securely as possible within the company. We, uh, we didn't want to lose funds over refunds or chargebacks or fraud. And it were really great years. I can give you my two takeaways from 888. It's, uh, it's a corporate by now, and I was moving through four organizational changes, uh, changing uh, a lot of um, VPs to report to and a lot of people to work with. Now, I learned that uh, you have to be open to new opportunities, because if I haven't uh, took my passport and traveled to Antigua, 
I, did, I wasn't able to learn everything that ha I have learned there. And also over the years, I came across a lot of projects and new fields of responsibility, and I always said, yes, just give me everything that you want me to handle. I can do that. I was very young. I was in my 20s, and I just wanted to learn and to do new stuff in order for me to reach my next uh, goals, which was to become a senior manager in this industry. And the second thing uh, that I learned, uh, it, w it was don't expect, just ask what you want. Uh, because when I left there, they told me, why are you leaving? You're working here for nine years and you're so successful and we love you. And I told them, listen, I'm not going to train anyone else to be my supervisor here at 888. If you're not going to give me the next VP position, I'm just leaving. And they, and they said, OK, so we can give you the next VP position. Just take it. And I said, no, I have already signed another agreement in another place. So I was expecting them to understand that I want this position, but I never said that loudly, just between me and myself. And this is a lesson that I took over for the next position. If I need something, if I want something, I should just speak out and not expect someone to think about me and to offer me something that I want. So my next stop was Memo Global. I was there, I was VP for risk management. That was my target to become a member of management in the company, in a global company. Uh, Memo Global is a company dealing with immigration. Um, we, we help people to immigrate either to the US, to the UK, to Australia, or to Canada. And there are different processes that you need to go through if you want to immigrate for your homeland country to these countries. And uh, it was very challenging also to get the funds moving inside an online environment for people who are sometimes unbanked or don't have credit cards. And we needed to be very creative. And also, uh, I was a member of the management, and suddenly I learned that uh, my division priorities sometimes comes under the company priorities. And uh, it was a nice experience to learn how to work in this environment. And after staying there for two years, I moved to Cal. Cal is one of the biggest acquiring bank in Israel. And I was working with them while I was working at 888 and Memo Global because we were processing the funds via Cal. It was one of the banks that we worked with. And I had a very good relationship with them. And they were searching for risk management people to join uh, the risk management division. So I moved there and I became the chief underwriter of Cal. And there I was underwriting and monitoring with my team, uh, team the merchants that needed to, uh, to accept credit cards processing within Cal. It was a very uh, nice position and for me it was kind of closing a circle because I was working on the other side like on the merchant and the high tech and then I moved to the bank and I figured that um, when I will be at the bank I will finally understand why they work like they work so I had a lot of time learning how the regulation work and it works and sometimes you can leverage your activity by utilizing the regulation it's not your enemy as uh, the fintech uh, always assumes. And also, I learned a lot about compliance with Visa and MasterCard, and uh, it was a very nice time for me to work there. Uh, I worked there for two years, and then, then I left because they have closed the operational activity and left only the domestic activity, and I wanted to move on. So I was working with several positions for several years, and I was thinking, like, what should I do next when I will become very big and old? And um, I figured I should do something for myself. So then I founded Payments OP, which is my core activity until today. And also I uh, founded two more activities. One of them is Fintivity and the, the other one is Fintech Ladies IL. I'll tell you in short about all these activities. So Payments OP is an advisory company. Uh, I have a great team of experts who are all e-commerce and risk management and compliance and regulation and cybersecurity experts, and we give a uh, full umbrella actually to organizations that are working online globally. So we help them to build the commercial connections that they need with the banking institution. We help them to design the product and the integration that they need in order to offer the customers a way to pay them. And we also give them everything that they need in order to be fully compliant and to work within risk management and to work properly and to save the funds within, within their bank account. Um, and also we have a lot of clients, some of them are international, some of them are more local. We work with startups that just got founded yesterday, literally, 
really, and they come to us and we help them from scratch to uh, build uh, all the systems that they need in, oper in order to operate online. And we also work with the big guys, with the banking solutions, with uh, marketplaces, with <laughs> ISVs, with payment solution providers, with everyone that actually needs to shift money from one place to another place. It's, uh, it's not so simple as you might think when it comes to payments. The Fintivity initiative um, is with a good friend of mine who was working several years in uh, Visa. And uh, we learned that uh, Israel, as you said, as the startup nation, has a lot of technology and a lot of fintech. And uh, this might be very interesting to overseas banks and corporations. So we have been locating banks overseas and corporations and uh, matching them with fintech that we have in Israel. Uh, Pre-COVID, we did it uh, with a few delegations. They used to come to Israel for two to three days, and then we present them with a few fintech companies. Well, not a few, it was actually very exhausting. We did kind of 15 to 20 different uh, fintech technologies uh, in two days. And then they will pick the technologies that they want to work with, and it was very good for the companies as well and for the banks. And um, also something that I'm very proud of, proud of is the Fintech Ladies IL, which I founded with my colleagues and friends. Uh, this is a community of women uh, who are uh, either Israeli or based in Israel. And we figure that these women need some way to connect, to interact, to have a professional um, discussions, and to mentor each other and to help each other to become more successful and uh, to find working places or to work together. And we're doing that for the past two years. We had several um, real-time events. Uh, the first one was with the Facebook uh, office in Israel. It was very nice. And um, also in Visa office and also in Wix offices. So we have several events. And we have a community in Facebook. And um, I think we have a nice uh, group of uh, women uh, around it. And uh, we can also like do a lot of cooperation uh, with you. So what's next? Uh, so today I'm looking for the next best thing. And in the past couple of months, I have been working on my own new venture, which is called Works, Works Payments. And this is a, a technical platform, a startup. This is something totally new that I'm doing these days. So Works is a, a holistic end-to-end -end payment platform. Uh, which is using human expertise and also technology, a very innovative technology, in order to help um, SMBs, startups, and small companies to actually get the payments as a commodity. Today, if you want to integrate to payment systems, you cannot just find one solution and to do a plug-and-play uh, connection to it. You need to have a lot of knowledge and connections and data and integrations and uh, this is very exhausting for some of the organizations, so this is why they choose the, just the, the easiest solution to, to integrate to. So while advising to a lot of organizations, we learned that sometimes it's hard for them to invest in consultancy and to have designs and to integrate it because the product is more important than anything else. So they will invest time in performance and in the product itself, but they wouldn't invest time in the payment system, although uh, they might get a lot of revenue out of just optimizing the payment systems. So we figured that we better build the one thing that we are looking in the market for the past five years, and th we didn't find it, kind of a system that can give you everything that you want in one place. So this is works. It uh, only needs one API connection to integrate to, and then you receive all the payment solutions in global markets. You can operate in the US in the EU, in Latin America, in Asia, uh, in any place in the world that you want to process funds that we're able to do it online. And also we offer you everything regarding risk management. You can also have your wallet management there. If you want to issue cards or get funding or do installments or subscription or get um, to the blockchain, everything is just in one place. And we are now uh, finishing the development and go to, going to the next level of fundraising. So I'm, I'm going to tell you about works a bit more, or um, actually about the travel that we have been doing in the past months, me and my team, and how we failed a few times. Uh, but this actually got us to the place that we are today. 
And uh, I always call it uh, fail forward. Like you can fail, but you have to take the lessons forward and then to do something better. So the story starts with understanding that we have the wrong technology in our hands. We took a very nice system which was very affordable with the pricing because we didn't have any funds at the time. And it was a nice system and we thought that it might be doing whatever we had in, in our mind, in the vision. But uh, in a few couple of weeks we discovered that it wasn't giving us what we need and the businesses that will connect to the system will not actually get what we wanted to give them. So we started developing on top of this system and then it didn't work as properly as we wanted to until it took us around a year to figure out that we need to just close this project and try to seek for a different technology or to develop it on our own. And then um, we saw also that the basic functionality that we had in this system is not good enough. We cannot really come up to the market with just an MVP product. We need something better. We need an upgraded system that can offer everything that startups want today. And uh, we learned another thing that as an advisory company, uh, we cannot really come to a company and tell them, listen, this is our system, just use it because it's the best in the market. They wouldn't believe us. They say, you are an advisor, you should be unbiased. You should just present all the systems that are there in the market and tell us who is the best system. And we told them, this is the best system because we have been examining like over 100 different systems and we know this one is better, but it wasn't working. So we realized we need to uh, differentiate between the two activities. So payments OP, we'll do the advisory and then we have works doing the technology because it's not the same. And then I decided to move to works and to keep payments OP with uh, the different team that is working on that. And then um, we decided to build it on our own. So we said, OK, we know how to design systems. We have been doing that for five to eight years. So what's the problem? But we discovered that it will cost us, I don't know, around maybe half or one million dollar at least to develop it. And it will take more than a year to get to the optimal stage that we want. So this was too frustrating because we wanted to be in the market today and not in a year. And we didn't have the, the fundraising, as Khadija said that investors like to invest in something that is already working and we didn't have anything but a presentation. But I did go to a few investors and discuss it with them and they told me this is great, but just come back to us when you have some real results. You have a system, you have customers and we'll be happy to invest in that. Um, and then we were searching a few systems. We wanted to take another system and to have it working, but we came across a few issues with IP rights and we figured out this wasn't uh, the best course to do it. Uh, but we have a good uh, ending to this story because we have uh, came across a very good partner which has the technology and is going to do uh, kind of a joint venture with us. And uh, we are going to offer works with him um, on the coming weeks. So to summarize up all this wonderful travel that I have been doing for the past years, uh, if I relate to women and tech, uh, two things that I want to say today to you. Uh, one thing that I learned is that we are equal, but we're not the same. Like we have different needs and we have different perceptions. And women are also not only users of digital content and digital technology. They can also be the ones that develop it and program it and design it. Because if we only have men on the other side, then the products might not be fully customized for women as well. So this is one important thing for the market to realize. Also research show, by the way, that uh, diverse teams are working better and getting higher results and better results with their products and with their technology. And the second thing that I want to tell you is, we discussed it a bit in the panel this morning, focus on the big picture. Today the market is uh, rapidly changing and the technology is growing. So on one hand we have machine learning and AI. So this means that very traditional uh, jobs will disappear as we go along with the years. So women might be affected more by this. But on the other hand, we have a gig economy, which is very flexible and comfortable for women and for men to work with. And I think that this means that each one of us as a person needs to improve his skill of set, set skills in order to be more adaptable for the future and in order to find positions that will be good for him. And uh, this relates to women and men as well. Okay.
Thank you very much.